cool. Uh, so hello everybody, not every day do I get to make a presentation at 7.30 in the morning, which is, I come from San Francisco, so I am awake, I am a bit jet lagged, so if it's anything goes wrong today, it's the jet lag, it's not me, but I will try to keep it sane for all of you folks. Uh, it's okay to yell out, so I can't quite see if you raise your hands uh, with, with a light, but it's okay if you yell out, it's, it's, it's completely fine. My name is Juni. I will be talking about DevSecOps pipeline design patterns. By pipeline, I mean continuous delivery pipeline. That's where I have invested most of my time in the last, I believe, decade. And it's really hard to do justice to such a rich topic in like 45 minutes, um, which is why you know it's okay to continue the conversations afterwards. I, I have kept my cards right at the door. If you don't get to chat, it's okay if you just grab a card and leave and we could connect afterwards. I'm on Twitter. I work for CloudBees and CloudBees does 80% of the contribution of Jenkins. So there's a lot of people I met at speaker's dinner who aren't quite familiar with CloudBees, but everybody knows Jenkins. And the creator of Jenkins is our chief technology officer. So it is basically the Jenkins company, but today I will do justice to the very latest creation from uh, on, on, the, on that ecosystem is, is the Jenkins X. It's a brand new offering, and James Strachan, who wrote the Jenkins X, is now an employee of CloudBees. So I will try to do as much as I can in these 45 minutes, but if I can't, like, it's, it's okay to just keep, keep talking about it. I have a couple of books to my name. Uh, the first one was Continuous Delivery Pipeline, Where Does It Choke? It essentially addresses issues which you should avoid. And the second one is The Power of Continuous Delivery in DevOps, actually DevSecOps. And that one focuses on more on the design and implementation of the pipeline. So while the first one is what you should not do, the second one focuses more on what you should do. And that's my website, continuity.world. You'll find description of both the books. Uh, there's one note, for the second book, there are many diagrams that I just, just give out for free download from my website. I will be using some of them right here today. And if, if you know, we can't get through everything today, then you can just go to the website and download the diagrams for free. So we will discuss savers for pipelines, right? Uh, nine of them, I, I do hope to go through all of them. Uh, tool phobia or tool mania, I don't know, uh, how, however you want to do it. We should do declarative pipelines versus scripted pipelines. This is something close to my heart and I'll go through a few quick examples of code. DevSecOps, and we'll discuss what happened to DevOps. I mean, I get that question all the time. The circuit breaker pattern, I'm sure with such an elite audience, you already know that. I'll just cover a quick business use case. The composition anti-pattern, the stuff that slows the pipeline down. Analytics and insights, this is, this is very close to the C-suite when they try to measure uh, and you know, trends and decide what, what's the next priority for the year, uh, whether where they should hire, et cetera. So even if you're in a developer conference and you, you, probably, you probably are a developer today, but there are some things that you should know right away so that you know, it, it kind of curves that growth path for us, all of us. And handoff anti-pattern is, Another thing that is, uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a poll if you know, I, I, I can see, but this is about dev handing off to QA, handing off to release, handing off to operations. And then God knows it's like this relay race that, uh, I mean, if you drop the button, everybody loses. It's, it's that kind of a situation. And the anti-corruption layer, and then we'll just do Jenkins X. So tool phobia. This is where a lot of companies start, continuous delivery and then drop it in the first month itself. So why, right? I try to bucketize if that word exists. It's like categorize the various sections of tools that come together to build a pipeline. So the orchestration layer, and like, like I said, like everybody heard about Jenkins, GitLab, GoCD, TeamCD, and some are Groovy-based, some are YAML-based, some are JSON-based. So configuration as code, I'm, I'm pretty sure all of you folks have, are familiar with that. So that's a layer, where is our source report, could we GitHub, Bitbucket, CodeCommit, uh, CodeCommit's AWS offering subversion, but I do recommend we don't continue to use subversion. 
There's the artifact repo, that is JFrog's artifactory, Sonotypes, Nexus, S3, Hockey App, and then there's dashboards like Sumo Logic, which is cloud-based. Uh, there's infrastructure as a service, there's platform as a service, and God knows how many as a services we have today. And there's analytics, uh, DevOptics being a cloud-based offering. It actually helps in value stream mapping your processes, finding out where the waste is, cutting it out before you automate, right? You don't want to automate the waste. The container ecosystem, that's where a lot of the competition is these days. Then there's Audit Trail. There's a reason why it's in bold and red. If you're using Cloud Trail, if you're on AWS ecosystem, or wherever you are, it doesn't really matter. The fact is, never turn it off, because this is, this is going to be needed when you face audits, ultimately. There's static analysis security testing. Coverity is a major player in this area. There's dynamic analysis security testing. OWASP ZAP is something you could potentially look at. Then there's code coverage, Cobertura, Jacoco. Jacoco is the Java code coverage only for Java, but then Cobertura also covers like other languages. And then there's static code analysis, Sonar, and the ESLens. There's functional testing, Selenium, and then Selenium on the cloud is handled by Sauce Labs. Then there's performance testing, BlazeMeter. I mean, there's JMeter and there's JMeter on the cloud is BlazeMeter. There's unit tests, there's feature flagging. LaunchDarkly is doing very well in that space. There's A-B tests, Optimizely, Build. You know, Builds, I'm, I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar. And then the last and not the least is databases. The chain management is handled by Liquibase, which is, I believe, still open source. And Datical is like the enterprise version of it. And then there's Flyway. So I do not intend to go on and on, because then that'll pretty much be the talk. But the, but the main, the big picture is, that's the whole thing. Uh, all the way, right? And it's often been a bummer for all companies who started it. I do recommend we do not start out this way. First, we look at basic patterns, processes, metrics, like what does success look like for us? Because otherwise, if you really go on, and then we will probably end up thinking, one, we don't have enough people. Two, we don't have enough money. And both of those would be pretty bad bummers. So. Let's look at declarative. So when you declare a pipeline, it's recommended. This is the, the Jenkins, the 2.0 declarative style. So when you say pipeline, you don't have to write anything else, because you know it's a pipeline. It's a domain-specific language. When you say it's a pipeline, and the agent, in this particular case, let's say you're doing Maven, and that's it. You just write image Maven, and you can choose your own version. If you do stages, it can be multiple stages, of course, and we look at those examples. But let's just look at, you know, simple, start simple. So you, you need to build, right? That's the very first thing you need to do. So, and you're using Maven to build, so that's it. And these few lines will actually get you anywhere you want to do for, for that particular part of the pipeline. Similarly, I think you get the idea. If, you're, if you were on Node.js, which is very, very popular these days, just say stages, just say stage, and then you know, use the Docker image, where, which is literally your build container, and then use the NPM commands just like you would otherwise. The third and the final example, Python, also very popular, but very, very similar. So if a new person joins the company and sees one of these, they'll immediately know what they're doing. Code reviews would be stupid simple, and you can move people between teams. Like, there's re really no steep learning curve. Now, what, is Dev what happened to DevOps? Well, nothing happened to DevOps. DevOps is still very much there, just the same way it was started. DevSecOps is we have a gun focus in security, and we always had it, by the way. For, for some reason, people may have done a bad job, then there was a number of security breaches, and then, you know, and then now it's gotten a slightly political, though. So should it be Sec DevOps? Should it be Biz DevOps? Should it be Dev QA RevOps? And while these conversations, I, I think I know where they are coming from, but the fact is, when we model, we take in all the functions that are necessary. It's not like we left any group out or any department out. It's like we, we took everything together. So we do say components, they're building, we are unit testing them, we are statically analyzing them. And by component, in this case, we mean the smallest distributable and testable unit. Could be an NPM, it could be like an NPM artifact, could be a Java jar file, whatever, whatever it is that you have. And the subsystem is the smallest deployable and runnable unit which means it can be stood up, right? You need to stand something up and then hit it with 
like customer use cases. So you deploy the subsystem, you run like functional contract security performance tests. If, if you're okay like with that and you do not have dependency, and we'll discuss that in a second, you can do a blue-green, and this is ZDD, like the zero downtime deployment. Blue-green is a part of it. You have all your current users on blue. Uh, you, you take the new stuff into green, you test it, and then if everything goes well, maybe you're A-B testing and you, know, you have your business KPIs, seems like B has a slightly better business result than A, then B goes live, and then all the users get incrementally dialed into the new uh, the new green. So, the, the, so the, the big picture is all the current users were on blue, you did a few things and decided whether you should turn them to green. And if something went wrong, which, which, which will happen all the time, you just switch back to blue. So you do not affect a lot of your customers at the same time, right? There's, there's uh, little risk. However, for starters, what is DevSecOps in this case? So, so Look at the, the five things. Let's see if my... So OSS, open source security, you are pulling all the stuff into your build. This are third-party libraries that you didn't write, but if you are pulling them down, it's your responsibility to make sure they don't have security vulnerabilities. And the, the worst example is Equifax, who just had a major bummer with the Apache struts use case, and I don't mean to pick on Equifax, but the fact that Apache Struts is also downloaded by hundreds of other companies who still haven't patched it, which means we will still get more bad news, right? But this is where you folks can help. And then there is unit testing. So unit tests can be written just to understand security stuff. It's not just the other stuff that we do. So that goes here. Then there's static analysis security testing. Right here, st static code analysis is not just for styling best practices, it's also to detect vulnerabilities. And then you have like containers, if you're deploying containerized applications, you do have to worry about that security. Then you have DAST, dynamic analysis security testing, which is right here, post deployment. So, so SAST is pre-deploy right here, and DAST is post deploy right here. So what would happen is, do you have, for starters, security specialists embedded in your Scrum teams? Because if you don't, everything happens out here, and that's a bummer. Because they, they take what you give them, and DevSecOps says you build security in, you don't hand over a finished product for evaluation. So if I were to give a definition in one line, that is what it is. But how do you build it in? You have to have security specialists inside your Scrum teams. Otherwise, not all developers were raised this way. They can be trained. All, all we need is new training. But in the beginning, maybe the Scrum team composition needs to be redefined. And how do I assess my security postures? So I was talking to a company who had SQL injection, this and that. And the fun part was they did not have any SQL. So a lot of companies have moved away from SQL, but they're still following the old definition of how to assess security. So maybe it's command injection, maybe it's not SQL injection, right? So I don't know what the situation is in your organization, but you kind of have to figure out what that is. And then declare multiple stages in the pipeline. So this is, this is where that, if, if, if I go back, so these are stages. Build is a stage, unit test, static analysis, and now you can, these are independent stages where you can use different containers because it's entirely possible that your application is, I don't know, let's say in Java, but your tests, in, not in this case, but your tests could be in Python. And it's perfectly possible to use different containers for those different stages. Another thing is, each stage could have multiple lines, and that's very obvious because if you are using, let's say, sonar for static analysis, you may want to make sure you collect the results, you put it in a layer of persistence, maybe you want to do analytics on it later on, and that's all fine. And this is, these are all Yoda's words, by the way. Fear is the path to the dark side, fear leads to anger. I think anger leads to, uh, I don't know, some kind of depression or something. We're forgetting Yoda's words, that's not a good thing. But anyways, so what happened when we had really good application security tests and they actually broke the pipeline? 
what did the team do? Well, obviously, we wrote a poem because there was nothing else we could have done. Uh, we, were, we were overjoyed that at least there was an application security test that was failing the pipeline. So, and, and by the way, this is inspired by Jamaica Farewell. I grew up with that song. I'm not sure if it's, if it's that popular, really. But you can actually sing it. And I even sang a version of it and put it on YouTube. Like, you know, when days your pipelines are broken and you have nothing to do, maybe you could go and like, just sing along with it. So down the way where the teams are gay, and I come from San Francisco, but I do mean happy. And the sun shines daily on the building tops. I took a trip on my pipeline ship. When I came to AppSec, I made a stop. Oh, I'm sad to say I broke the pipe today. It won't be up for many a day. And stage is down and heads are turning around. Explain how it happened in stand-up town. Well, assuming there is a stand-up for all of us, we are like saying, oh, I didn't change anything. Did you commit anything? No, there were no changes. Then how's the pipeline broken? It's like the daily, daily stand-ups are never really 15 minutes. And even if you are standing up, it doesn't mean it's really agile because it's just that you're taking orders standing up rather than sitting down. And that doesn't help any of the re real problems. So let's look at the number four, which is the circuit breaker pattern, which is, uh, I mean, you know, you might have software as a service, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or, or something else. So this essentially is now I've abstracted the whole pipeline and its code, its configuration as code, its process as code. You, you're talking to a dashboard, uh, static code analysis, build servers, and these guys are talking to each other, like the artifact repo. You're downloading the artifacts, you're like working on them, then you're uploading the versioned artifacts. Environments could be AWS, anything, and then config servers and change management servers if you're facing audits. So here's the circuit breaker, which is like, if you really don't need to do something real time, you could eat, and, and if it's broken, you don't break the pipe. You don't break the pipeline for that, right? Like if you couldn't deploy, it's a showstopper. But if you couldn't load your metrics, it's okay to do it in the background or afterwards because here's where your customers are and they really want to pay you money and you really want that money, right? <laughs> so this is where you all want to be. But this is where we all get stuck, like going up, down, up, down, up, down. But really, we want to move from left to right. Can I do pipeline as configuration? Of course, you could do YAMLs and the groovy declarative patterns. You could do JSON. And then, is my network topology optimized for continuous delivery? It's if your build server is in the East Coast and your artifact repo is in the West Coast, and this is triggers of your commits, and this is a coast-to-coast -coast transaction, continuous delivery is not going to get you anything because it will just slow down very, very badly. It depends on the network conditions. And there's, there's a popular myth that it's my vendor. Yeah, but if you signed up with Sauce Labs and that's where your functional tests run, and you are hosted on, let's say, AWS, I don't know, in the east zone, east region, and Sauce Labs says we have our data center in the west, and that's a big, big problem because it doesn't matter if it's your vendor. It's whenever you design this topology, it's your responsibility to make sure the speed will be honored. And then how do you protect and defend, like audit trailing? So what did Yoda say? Uh, I, I'm going to do better this time. So try not, do or do not, there is no try. So we're going to dishonor Yoda today, and I might have to stay back in Vienna for that. So. If you have a pipeline, you have options, timestamps, stages, you know, we, we kind of went through a little bit of this. Sometimes when you're making a connection that needs to be, there needs to be a retry in the pipeline, it's okay to do a retry even though Yoda, did, Yoda doesn't quite like retries. If you have a timeout, like you need to run something and you know these tests run in seven minutes, eight minutes, you can time out with 10 and let, let everybody know that it's going longer because there is really no point in eating up those cycles. Maybe something has already gone wrong, and it seems like you've retried three times or something like that. So, again, like these are, these are patterns that can help recover from failures if you were having a failure that day. The composition adder pattern, and uh, th this is important, is if you have, let's say, a subsystem, which is, again, a deployable and runnable unit, 
it's a node. This is Java API, let's say, and these guys talk. Let's say this is another Java API, and maybe the node artifact talks to these Java APIs too. So essentially, if you have one, two, three, all the way to n subsystems that need to be deployed to production, and if you're assembling all of them and validating all of them together, that's bad because you are essentially probably building a monolith. Uh, we use that word pretty often. We say a number of things about microservices, but what, what is it really that, that, that ends up looking like this? Is you, if you, if you uh, what was that saying? So chain is uh, as weak as it's, uh, sorry, string and chain is as strong as its weakest link. So in here, you are slowing the fastest team down at the speed of the slowest team. So what's the point of being fast? Because if these are the fastest people, they cannot go until everybody gets their acts together. So everybody is tied at their hips for success, and that is not a good feeling. If you take employee engagement, service, you know, developer productivity, et cetera, these are the things that, bog, that bother us. And do I have monoliths versus SOA versus microservices? So it's, it's a good question to ask yourself. Microservices, the definition is, by the way, the golden Martin Fowler definition. I see a lot of companies have redefined microservices based on what they have today and because they just want to say, we, we are microservices. And that's probably not the case. It's a good, good read if you just search Martin Fowler microservices. It, it gets you to a very nice definition. And do I have the return on invest to strangulate my whole monolith? So one through N, N can be humongous, depends on how much of legacy code you have inherited. You may have done an acquisition, uh, while you may have followed all the best practices, maybe they haven't. So, Maybe it's, you know, you need to do three, seven, and nine first because the whole thing takes three years, and by three years, if, you, if this is the only project you do, you might actually go out of business in three years, so really, it's, it's not going to be worth it. So it's driven by the return on investment in this case. And then again, am I stuffing everything into a container? Because everybody said containers are cool, but if you stuff an elephant into a container, you know, it's still a containerized elephant. So I don't see the value, like on day one, it might seem cool, but it, it actually will have the exact same repercussions. So this, do my applications lend themselves to 12-factor? If you just type 12factor.net on your browser, and there are these 12 factors that show up, if your application meets those 12 factors, they lend themselves to containerization much easily. Otherwise, it's just you're, you're trying to pass this elephant through the pipeline, and now I, I don't know if I'm worried more about the pipeline or the elephant. And for me, the elephant and the containerized elephant is really the same. It, and, and it's actually worse, because now you have put in all the effort to containerize what otherwise is an elephant. And how can I avoid a big ball of mud is the question, but I also add, a big ball of mud leads to a big ball of test. So how can you avoid both? Because now I have a big ball of test that run to validate that big ball of mud. Essentially, to, to, to put one change into production, it seems like a lifetime, and it seems like a crime scene when the deployments are happening. So analytics and insights, biggest bang for the buck, what is it that we should measure? Should we measure the, the velocity? Like, how, how long does a check-in take to go through dev, through stage, and to production? And I'm assuming three environments. I don't know why there should be more, but it, it is possible that you have a variation of this. So pipeline deploys on dev versus stage versus production. So if you're having 80% deployments going on dev, maybe 10% stage, 10% production, you see that there is a drag. And, and you know, it's not a one data point that you should chase, but if this happens for over a quarter, then it's telling you a story as in where you should go and look, right? What's the first thing you should do, like to, to understand why things are always on dev and doesn't really percolate to stage. The failures due to unit test, functional test, performance test, security vulnerabilities, if you, if you have a chart and everything seems like 50% of all your test failures are performance, that's a story, right? That's, that's what should be prioritized for the sprint. And this is a personal favorite. So if you have an index and the, the real value that you care about is really in the, the, the center of gravity of this triangle. So if you have 
if you want to measure code quality, and a lot of people would argue whether it is cyclomatic complexity, whether it's code duplication, whether it's unit test coverage, instead of making a battle out of it, you can have all three metrics on the sides of a triangle and have a value, an index, that is really in the middle. And while this is a very naive example, this also goes into sorting out battles between departments, which are also some sort of a political battle, let's say, like people say, oh no, this is the right metric, that is the right <laughs> metric. So do I provision devs 1 through M, devins 1 through N, performance 1 through X? I mean, no, right? I mean, if you are containerized, you can just spin up, spin down as needed. These are ephemeral. You, you can't scale if for every developer who joins the company, you provision an environment. Like, who's going to even maintain all of that? And then do I know how many environments I have and how many I need? So it might seem silly to you. But I've often been in meetings where a new environment was discovered in the meeting. I'm like, where was this? Oh, this is a Jenkins that we've always had? I'm like, yes, but where was it? Like, where is it? Is it under someone's desk? Or like, you, you know. And you can build a pipeline if you don't even know where stuff is. And funny as it may sound, it, it happens quite frequently. And then, I mean, whoever seen Jerry Maguire, you know, he had this moment, show me the money, he was told. And I often end up in meetings where I have to justify the return on investment of building a continuous delivery pipeline. And it's usually in the millions, by the way, because this is not a side job. So what did we achieve? Like, why did we do it? And if you want to measure business value per sprint instead of, let's say, number of releases, number of tests executed. So number of releases doesn't get you any business. Number of releases just means you move bits from point A to point B. It's a great thing, like I'm not downplaying velocity. It also means you, are, you have predictable releases, but it may, be, it may mean that a company is still not making any money. And if you're talking to your C-suite, they'll often care about that because whatever it is that you're doing, it's all great, but you know, it, we are still losing customers. So it's not the typical thing like a departmental infighting or anything like that. To, to the C-suite, it's something that is related to your customers. Stability index is one of those indexes. So I asked Dev, what does stability mean to you? They said, oh, it's check-in to go live. Like, how fast can my check-in go live? I asked Ops, what does stability mean to you? They said it's number of escaped defects. means number of defects that the pipeline couldn't catch, and then there was downtime in production, and customers were very, very pissed off. I asked business, what does stability mean to you? They said it's customer delight. So if they are satisfied, we are satisfied, period. I do not care what else you are measuring. So, but everyone is right, right? Like, it's not because I was raised in engineering that I can ignore the other departments, no. So again, like, try to build everybody into an index. You could have a weighted index, but you don't need to complicate it unless, you know, it's needed. And then, of course, we forget to sometimes measure the number of escape defects. We joyously measure how, how good our pipeline is, how many defects they are catching, but then there are these other defects that they never caught. So, but you still need to keep things in perspective. And do I trend speed and quality on the same canvas? If people say speed or quality, it's not. It's speed and quality. And there have been multiple surveys that people who are going fast, they're actually going fast pretty safely. So, it's not an or, it's an and. And if you have the same canvas where you, know, you have both the trends, it's, you can measure it and fix the problems. So do teams have conflicting goals? Like if you tell dev, go as fast as you can. And if you tell ops, not at all, like don't let anything go. You're, you're essentially pitting them against each other, and then you're saying, I've done DevOps, you haven't. Because you, just, you just, just made two teams fight with each other, and you sent conflicting messages to them. And then, of course, now there's DevSecOps, so there's, there's, you know, there's, there's one more twist to it. Are my KPIs departmental or organizational? I think I touched on this, that if you're a release engineer and you're measuring number of releases, if you're a quality engineer, you're measuring the number of tests executed, you're, you're both right in a certain perspective. It is important, but from the organization, it's really the customer who's the most important. And post from your pipeline, this is like, uh, for the Java folk, this is like the finally that happens at the end, irrespective of what else you did in that pipeline. So once you, know, you did, a, did whatever you had to do in your pipeline, 
You have to post results, notices, logs, metrics, anything that you are you know, wanting to clean up. This, this, is, this is pretty cool stuff. And could be, you know, you just mail, it's okay, like that becomes a repo of all kinds of notices that you may mine those notices later, specifically for audit trailing and analytics. You could use Slack, you know, have a channel where you're sending stuff, and that channel builds up information over a period of time that you mine. This is like the best data mining, best data analytics, and, and it's also relatively inexpensive. You could, of course, have Kafka buses, you know, pu put everything in a database and mine it too, but unless you are a huge enterprise, you may not get return on investment. If you're small, then just start small. But audit trail and analytics are not optional in pipelines. And these are a few more examples. So post, like always, means just do it, like irrespective of what the pipeline did, or if it's on success, if it's on failure, open a ticket. And then if it's unstable, open a ticket. But now you know that it's, it's probably not for X, for Y. If it changed, which means it was passing before and now it's failing. If it's fixed, which means it was failing before and now it's passing. And if it got aborted, then manually, Oh, uh, by who? Because you really need to know who went and clicked a board. And regression, these are like the repeat offenders. So if you, are, if you really tested locally, it shouldn't have failed in the first place. So if, why is it regressing to begin with? Handoffs, this is like, you know, you're, you're, you have walls and silos, you, 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 you all heard this story, like, you know, silos are bad, etc. But if you have fragmented departments, dev, QA, tools, infrastructure, platform release, infosec ops, your check-in to go live, if this is your success metric, will be pretty slow, because if you've done a value stream map, which is this, the VSM, it will show that every handoff is expensive, it costs you. However you feel it was just an email or a Slack message or, you know, one meeting, quick meeting, these are very expensive over a period of time. And then these people who are always telling you what to do, they are far away from where the problem actually appears. So even if they are trying to tell you what to do, it doesn't always work that way, right? We, we, we know that very well. And while all this magic is happening, the customers are waiting, the ones who will actually give us some money. So. Ask yourself, do I seek sign-offs? And why? Like, because I was told to, I, I get that part. But maybe you could go back and have a conversation with the person who's actually trying to give the sign-offs, right? If you don't seek sign-offs, give sign-offs, instead build the audit trail in an automated fashion, it's basically trust and verify. Automated waste is better than manual waste, but it's still waste. So do not automate any waste. Do a value stream map, find out where your waste is, cut it out, throw it away. Something that has worked for 20 years doesn't mean it's right. So please just, like, you know, sometimes it's hard to stand up and say bluff, but it's actually, a, you, you'll be doing a favor for your company if you call those bluffs, like, it's happening for a long time, doesn't mean it's right. So the flow is, I'm sorry. The flow is from left to right. This is this and the drag is from right to left. So you increase the flow, reduce the drag. Parallel is like you parallelize steps that can run in parallel, so that checking to go live is actually more optimized. I've seen people do in sequence because that's just why it, how it was, but there are many steps in the pipeline that can actually go in parallel. So you find those steps, like if you run security tests and performance tests in parallel, that's actually a good thing. And if you can even run integration tests in parallel, like if, if that's what helps you save some time. So anti-corruption layer is, so you have these assets that the pipeline talks to, and you have these interfaces, right? You have a log to dashboard, you have a publish artifact, you have run tests, you know, manage change requests. What if you were publishing artifact to artifactory and someone in your company says, oh, we are moving to Nexus. Entire pipeline, like all pipelines in the company go down that day because this interface is not built for ACL. So you, a developer shouldn't be bothered by if, if a, a vendor change is happening. Another example, if you are moving from on-prem data center installations on VMs to, let's say, AWS in the cloud, 
If you have an interface that protects you and the shared services team or you know, whatever that team is, they make the implementation behind the scenes, then all pipelines that day are not going to just come down. Your customers are not going to get hurt. So are my assets on-prem, cloudy? I mean, this is a good time to be having those conversations. Everybody is trying to move to the cloud. You know, cloud is the new sunshine. It's, it's all great. But there are things that you need to figure out and have ACLs protect your productivity otherwise. Do I have role-based access control? Because if you don't, your InfoSec team, audit, governance, compliance, legal, are not going to allow your pipeline to go from dev to stage to production. They're going to keep you on dev, and they're going to say that's what continuous delivery is. You just go to dev, but it's not. You really go to stage and then to production, because that's where your customers are. But then if you do not have role-based access control, and SOD, which is separation of duties or segregation of duties or separation of concerns, there are many kinds of names. The pipeline is going to be stalled at some point, right? And there will be like legitimate reasons to do so. So input, you know, sometimes you just have to stop and ask and to get a get permission. And it's okay to start this way, although human intervention is not encouraged at all. Right, but you, you can say for now, like pipeline is no longer problem. Do you agree? And someone says yep, and only two people can say yep, right? And that is a way of controlling who can push the change. Everybody should be able to push the change, but it's okay to start by having the two most knowledgeable people give you uh, approval just for starters, by the way. And then everything settles down. You just remove this one block, right? I mean, that's a start. And then managing secrets, super critical. If you have like credentials that you need to protect, everybody in this room needs to protect their credentials, irrespective of what department you are in. And these are like a way where you put your environment variables. And of course, if you can echo them, because that's the whole point. If you can just echo it and put it on the console, boof, that, that your whole pipeline is going to come down either in an audit or something of that sort. So make sure you go through these DSLs, the declarative patterns. There's such less code, such less maintenance. All you really need to do is know which one, which button to push. Some more managing credentials, like there's a with credentials DSL. You can put like certificates, like you, you, know, you need access to this app and that app, and you have the credential IDs. I'm not going into the syntax in this, like in the interest of time, but I'm sure you, know, you can just go look up search with this and you'll have the syntax. And with that, Jenkins X is the absolute brand new offering. It's a CI CD solution way better than anything I've personally seen. And my first task when I joined CloudBees was to just assess it as an outsider, and I was so thrilled that I decided to bring it to this conference. It's for modern cloud applications. It's on Kubernetes, so the, it's very opinionated. So if you are opinionated against Kubernetes, it is likely going to be an issue for you. But if you think Kubernetes is really the thing, then this will work for you. And then James Strachan, who's a, who's a fellow employee at CloudBees, is the creator of this. And this is a blog that will get you started. It got me started in no time. Uh, uh, James did a really good job. And what, what we are going to see right now is the out-of-the-box experience. And I'm going to go through all, all these things. I'm, I'm going to just come back and you know, wrap it up. So if you have, you can see my screen, that's awesome. So that's the website. Okay. So if you go to the, the, the 2017 book, some of these diagrams you will really like. That's, that's what I talked about early on. You can just do like free downloads. And these are some of the diagrams that map the pipeline from end to end along with tools and fragmentations and all the steps that happen. So I do encourage you to you know, take a look after, afterwards. This is the Jenkins X site, and quick start is it really gets you started in no time. Uh, you can pretty much uh, I'll introduce you a little bit to JX is the command line. It's the it's basically a short for Jenkins X, and create the new cluster is how I started. But if you have a Kubernetes cluster, you don't really need to go all the way. And I started because I had a new laptop that I was setting it up with the the one that I'm demoing it from. You have all these features like command lines, pipelines, environment, and 
The stuff is on GitHub, so if you know you're very curious, you can go look at all this code. And if you have any issues, I file the issues just as much as I encourage all of you to file it right here. And I'm distributing all this from my slide. And what I did was I did it on Google Cloud. I also encourage you to try it on Google Cloud. And because I know for sure it's working, that's the only thing I really did was to create a project ID as the Junigenix thing. And once you have the, the cloud, this is the Jenkins X setup. Let me just go through it. So I don't know if you folks are familiar with the GitOps stuff. If you are, uh, you know, you, you'd probably appreciate that I, I like it very much that this is one second. There you go. So this is the pipeline for the application. And I'm going to show you a sample application right now. It's very simple, a Go application. But it's not the point. Means the, and then you have staging and production as Git repos. Like GitOps is one of the things that really saved a lot of my pain point, the ones that I, were, I was having in the past, predictability, velocity, et cetera. This is like the super best thing. So staging is just a pipeline. You would see what's going on when code is getting promoted, like what the versions are, 0, 0, 001, 4, and 5. And why didn't 2 and 3 go? Because I had deliberately introduced a mistake to see how it's looking. And this is the blue ocean view, by the way. If, you, if you're fami not familiar with the blue ocean view, this is blue ocean. I, I introduced a mistake. I just faked an uh, error in a print statement. It failed. And I just replayed it to see if it was item for it failed again. I fixed the error. It passed. The version fifth is the one that I really wanted to push to production. There's just one caveat. The promotion to staging is fully automated. The, production, uh, the promotion to production is still manual. It's just to give you guys a feel, like you know how, how it feels. And all you really need to do is, I just, you know, this is that application. And all this was automatically created, by the way. I didn't write a single piece of code here. It was all written out of the box. This is just a very simple Go application that got deployed from dev to stage to production. This is the print statement that I was just faking, like, you know, I created a mistake and stuff like that. But you'll be amazed how the Docker file for containerizing the app, this was all deployed on the Kubernetes cluster on Google Cloud. I can just shut down my laptop. Everything will still be fine. Nothing's on my laptop. There'll be no destruction. And then the make file is there. The Jenkins file is there. I think you'll appreciate the Jenkins file now a lot because we went through some of the stuff. So these are the stages. These are the steps. These are the environments and everything else. In the interest of time, I can't quite do the code review here, but you folks, and then there are these uh, charts. So it's automatically creates, it's fully integrated with GitHub. It automatically creates everything on GitHub, whatever I was showing you on local. So if you just go here, you'll see the staging and the production environments. And this is the application, the one that I was showing you from local. All the files are here, version control it is. And then this is staging. If you see this URL, this is all like deployed on a Kubernetes cluster on the Google Cloud. Uh, I, you know, I was playing with this hello statement. And then this is production. It went to production through a manual uh, command, which is probably uh, OK, I probably can't find it. It's in the command registry. And then Helm is what is being used behind the scenes for packaging. And if, if you folks are not familiar, it's just helm.sh. And you, know, you can pretty much have a lot of the stuff here. So I'm going to speed up, obviously, like this is way over time. So I did go through the detect the type of the existing projects. So I said, you know, I do want to do a quick start on Go. But you don't have, if you have an existing project, just say what it is. And Jenkins X can automatically detect it and create everything for you, like that whole GitHub and GitOps and the environments and everything. You have GitHub integration. You have Docker file to containerize the apps. You have managing, configuring Jenkins, authoring the Jenkins files for the pipelines. You have the Helm charts. And GitOps, my favorite. And here are some of the stuff that just helps you pipe on, like the commands, the community, the Kubernetes channel. So I use this regularly because I, I, I have a question for James, then that is where everybody else is. 
And with that, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Like, I'm privileged to be in Vienna in such an elite group today. I hope to be back someday. And if there's anything you need from me, just hit me up on Twitter. Thank you very much.